I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. Perhaps the most insidious weapon that Satan uses to attack Christians is to get our eyes off of Jesus. If Satan cannot deceive us, divide us, or discourage us, what he will often do is to divert us. The passion we once had for Jesus can be replaced with an acceptance of things as they are. Satan wants us to become so satisfied with where we are, with what we are doing, and with what we have accomplished. Instead of maintaining a fiery passion for Christ and for his kingdom, we could lose our zeal for Christ and his kingdom. We replace an all-consuming passion with a complacency that is content with the way that things are. It is important to remember that these seven letters to seven churches that can be found in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation were real churches in real cities in Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey. When we deal with these churches in these two chapters of Revelation, we are dealing with real, historical churches. The Lord Jesus wrote letters that apply to that period of time to those churches. However, these are not only historical churches, they are also perennial churches. In this sense, each of these churches is a little bit unique from all the others, and so they represent the types of churches that perennially exist throughout the church age. We are dealing then with a real historical church, but we are also dealing with a perennial problem in churches. In the case of the Ephesian church, there are plenty of churches throughout all of church history that could be characterized as those who have grown cold in the matter of their love for Christ. This letter written by the Lord Jesus to the church in Ephesus is known for one very remarkable statement made in chapter 2 verse 4. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Ephesus will be forever known as the church that left its first love. As we focus on the letter in this episode of the podcast, we're going to come to grips with the danger of love growing cold in the lives of believers. In each of these seven letters to the seven churches, Jesus makes an evaluation of both good and bad of that church. Then he appeals for repentance and a plea for the return to faith, with a spiritual promise to those who overcome. The first part of the letter to the church at Ephesus is found in Revelation 2 verses 1 to 3 and says the following, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. The first thing that Jesus wants to make clear to the church at Ephesus was that he was the Lord of all the churches. He was in their midst, observing among the lampstands. He was also in direct control of the angels of the churches and therefore had full access to the leadership of each church. One thing that we should never do is to think of the church as our church, our special little social club. The church is Jesus' church and no one else's. The first part of Acts chapter 19 describes how the church at Ephesus was started by the Apostle Paul. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Unto what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. This church at Ephesus had been begun by the Apostle Paul. He worked there for over two years. 
and many years later he sent Timothy to this church. The two letters to Timothy are addressed to him while Timothy was working there. Ephesus was not the capital of the Roman province of Asia, but it was certainly the most important city in Asia. In fact, a Roman writer called it Luminasia, which means the light of Asia. It was a great commercial center and was a major crossroad of the Roman Empire. One of the highways came from the north from Pergamus and Smyrna. Another came from the northeast from Sardis, Galatia and Phrygia. One came from the southeast, a great trade route from the Euphrates through Colossae and Laodicea into Ephesus. Another came from the south, from the rich Meander Valley. So Ephesus became known as the marketplace of Asia, or the gateway to Asia. The city was known throughout the Roman world as the center for the worship of the goddess Artemis, or Diana as she was known in Rome, and the great temple of Artemis was located there. This great temple was larger than two rugby fields in length, and was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Its ruins are still visible today. The city had great influence in the Roman world, a position of worldly power and influence. Jesus sees three commendable things about this church. Firstly, he says that they are hard, committed workers. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. They were active and busy people, continually working, and our Lord commends them for that. Secondly, their doctrine was orthodox, and Jesus commends them for this. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil who have tested those who called themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. They did not run after every theological fashion and trend that came along. They examined teachings as to whether or not they were true, and they strongly opposed some of the teachings that were being presented by some of the popular speakers of that day. In his last visit with the elders of the church at Ephesus, the apostle Paul had warned them that they would have trouble in this area. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one with tears. So in Revelation 2 verses 2, the Lord Jesus acknowledges that they had followed the apostles' advice. They had checked up on speakers and had refused the teachings of many. They had tested those who claimed to be apostles and found them to be false. How do we examine whether teaching and preaching is in line with the scriptures and what is true and what is false? Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 verses 32 that, Now I am commending you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What is the ground for testing? It is whether a teaching agrees with the scriptures, with the word of God's grace, as he calls it here. Remember always that when Jesus addresses the churches in Revelation, he addresses the entire church, all the members, not just the pastor or the elders. The third thing Jesus commends them for is found in verse 3. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. The Ephesian church had persisted in their teaching and their work despite much discouragement and hardship. They were not quitters. However, this is the church in serious trouble, despite all the commendable things. Jesus says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstands from its place unless you repent. Jesus puts it in one brief phrase, you have abandoned the love you had at first. This must be a serious life-threatening problem because Jesus says, if you do not correct it, I will remove your lampstand. The removal of the lampstand does not mean that the members of the church would be condemned to hell and the church destroyed. What it does mean is that the church would lose its ability to shed the light of truth with no influence or impact spiritually on the community around itself. They would be busy doing religious but entirely irrelevant things. There are many churches today where congregations are still meeting Sunday after Sunday, but they have no spiritual impact. They see no change in people's lives because their light has failed. How many of us have left our first love? In the phrase, you have abandoned the love, the word abandoned in Greek is aphimi, which means to leave, forsake or depart. 
it stresses an action for which one is personally responsible. This is not love that you lose, but a love that you have left, and this suggests three specific problems. Firstly, they have moved away from the original position of devotion and zeal for the Saviour by gradual departure. Hebrews 3 verses 7 to 12 explains this falling away. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of the testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for forty years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they will not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you with an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Secondly, they came to put service to the Lord ahead of love, devotion, and fellowship with Him. Proverbs 4 verses 23 reminds us to Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Thirdly, their labor gradually came to be merely mechanical, the things they were responsible to do. But the Lord Jesus wants it to be the result of His abiding life, the result of the intimate walk with Him through the Spirit of God. In Paul's own letter to the Ephesians, he reminds them, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. But Jesus, standing in the midst of the church, saw what was missing. They had left, not lost, their first love. The local church belongs to Christ. Paul writes in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 11, verses 2, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. There is always the danger of that love growing cold. Just like Martha, we can be so busy working for Christ that we have no time to love Him. Christ is more concerned about what we do with Him than for Him. Labor is no substitute for love. To the public eye, the Ephesian church was successful, but to Christ's eye, it had fallen. What caused the condition in the Ephesian church? It is because they left and abandoned their first love. But what is first love? It is the love we felt for Jesus when we first came to know Him. Our hearts were filled with gratitude and thanksgiving, and we had eyes for no one but Him. Think of the times we've heard the testimony of a new Christian, when people break down completely, unable to finish telling their own story, being so overcome by the wonder of the fact that Jesus had come to live His life through them. Their lives had turned around 180 degrees. Their sins have been forgiven. Then the love of Jesus was something new, fresh, heart-stopping and amazing. That is the impact of first love. A new Christian eagerly takes on various ministries. For them it is a delight to serve, to help and to reach out to others. It seems the least they can do for such a wonderful Lord. However, gradually with the years there comes a small shift of focus. We get busy, and what we do for Christ slowly begins to become more important to us. Gradually, our position, our status, the desire for approval by others begins to take first place. We go on doing the same things, but not from the same passion or motive. There are three signs that indicate the abandoning of our first love. Firstly, there is a loss of joy and the thrill of Christian life. It becomes boring and routine. Second is the loss of our ability to love others. 1 John 4 verses 19 tells us that the reason we love others is because we have been first loved ourselves. Instead, we become critical and complain. Third is the loss of a healthy perspective of ourselves. We become more and more important in our thinking. Instead of what the Lord wants and what will please Him, we begin to think of what we want and what will please us. Self-centeredness sets in. This is what was happening at Ephesus. We have all done this at times. We have all felt the symptoms of a loss of first love. But when the whole church begins to reflect that atmosphere, it will soon lose its influence. Its light goes out. Its lampstand has been removed. Love is supposed to grow. I mean, I love my wife more today than I ever have. I love my son more today than I did when he was first born. So love should always grow. I wonder what we would feel if Jesus would have to say to some of us, You don't love me like you used to. Certainly it would break our hearts if our spouse said that to us, 
Would it break our hearts if we knew that the Lord Jesus felt that way? What do you do when that happens? How do you recover from this? Jesus gives three clear, specific steps to take. Remember, repent, and return. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, he says in Revelation 2 verses 5. Look back and remember what it was like when you first came to Jesus. Remember the joy that you had in the Lord. Remember the delight that you took in reading of the word and in the hearing of it. Then, repent. Repentance in the original Greek literally means to change your mind. Change your mind about that ambition. Change your mind about looking for approval and what is motivating your work. Change your critical spirit and your complaining attitude. Put the Lord back in the center and the focus of your life. Finally, return. We must do what the Lord tells us to do. Repent and return to where you were before. Do the works you did at first, Jesus says. What are those things? We read our Bible eagerly. We could not get enough of it. We longed to find out what the Word of God said. We prayed about everything, even asking the Lord to find the parking place. We responded to the hurts and needs around us with compassion and with love, and we did not think it was something that was stealing our time. We praised the Lord from our hearts. In verse 6, Jesus says a rather strange thing. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Why did Jesus not mention this in the things he commended earlier? The answer is that this was where the Ephesians were to begin. Let me paraphrase verse 6 to explain. Jesus is saying in effect, return to your first love, but retain your hatred of such practices which I also hate. That is how to fan this remaining ember in your first love into a brilliant flame once again. Start here and return to the place you once were. There is a lot of controversy as to who these Nicolaitans were. They also feature in the letter to the church at Pergamum. Church history tells us that the Nicolaitans were a group that linked Christian faith with loose sexual practices. Clement of Alexander, an early Christian theologian, said about the Nicolaitans, they abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. They believed that you could be Christian, but your sex life could be still worldly. It seems that they also taught that through their sexual activity and their superior knowledge, they would become gods. Nicolaitan can be directly translated from Greek as conquerors of the people. When we look at this letter and how it fits into church history, we see the leaving of first love becoming widespread in the churches after the apostles had passed away. This first period of church history covers the years from 70 AD when the temple was destroyed to about 160 AD. During that time, the churches were drifting away from a warm, loving, compassion-filled ministry to the world and becoming more involved in doctrinal controversies and theological discussions. They were moral, but had become increasingly formal and dogmatic. In Revelation 2 verses 7 is Jesus' appeal to this church and the promise he makes to it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is, to the one who is willing to listen to the voice of the Lord. Do we have an ear to hear what Jesus says? Do we respond with sympathy and obedience to the word that he gives us? Do we have a listening and hearing ear? Finally, Jesus says in verse 7, To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is Jesus' promise to the Ephesian church and to us. An overcomer is a Christian. To you true believers, he says, to you true Christians, I want to give you a promise. The tree of life, you will remember, was in the Garden of Eden at the beginning. It was the tree that Adam and Eve were free to partake of until they sinned. After that, they were excluded from the garden in case they should eat of the tree of life and continue for eternity in deathless sin. The tree will appear again in Revelation chapter 22, in a new heaven and a new earth, with a tree of life in the midst of the city, with its twelve fruits which will be the food of the people of that city, with its twelve fruits which will be the food of the people of the city. Jesus is that tree of life. It is a symbol of Jesus. If we draw strength from him, pray to him, if we listen to what Jesus says and obey it, our spiritual life will flourish, and we will grow strong to overcome and conquer the pressures and struggles that we encounter. 
This is what is supposed to occur at the communion table. We feed upon the bread, which is another symbol of Jesus. We are supposed to gain strength by feeding upon the life of Jesus, taking from him that which allows us to be all that he wants us to be. The power for the church to do good in our world comes from the believers who have been so radically changed by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ and are so appreciative of that change that they find themselves wanting to do good. However, no matter how much effort a church expends, if it abandons its first love, it stands in danger of being shut down by the Lord and losing its opportunity for service. Let us pray that the Lord will give us ears to hear and that we will respond to his leading. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 21.